So thank you all for joining us here. I just want to introduce myself. I'm Kat Trataris, and I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships of the San Francisco Art Institute. And this is our final week of professional development workshops. So we're very excited to have Emily and Nando here, co-founders of Bika, to talk about their project and to talk about the joys of starting an art space. <laughs> It's all joy, all the time. <laughs> Your voice. Um, thanks, Kat. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, my name is Nando Alvarez, um, and this is my wife, Emily. Emily, and we're here to talk about how to start a thing. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I'm Emily Reynolds. I'm a curator and also a marketing specialist. I graduated from SFAI in 2014. Um, I was an exhibition and museum studies MF, or MA, um, and uh, after that, I worked at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in the marketing department for about six years, and then about two years ago, we moved to Buffalo, New York, and uh, now I am the marketing manager at University of Buffalo Art Galleries and the co-founder of the Buffalo Institute for Contemporary Art. Uh, and I am Nando Alvarez Perez. Uh, I'm an artist and uh, graduated with my MFA from SBI in 2014 as well. Um, I currently am uh, adjuncting as of yesterday at Alfred University. Um, and I am originally from Buffalo, which is a big part of uh, why we landed back here um, and why Bika's here. Um, and also, heads up, um, I, I stutter, so uh, bear with me. And if you have questions, you can just call them out. Yes, please. <laughs> or this you can put them in the chat, or yeah. you can ask them at the end. There'll be plenty of time. Um, but this is a pleasantly small and informal thing, so. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to run through a few of the things that uh, project art projects art spaces that I've uh, worked on in uh, since graduating. Um, the first one is Boston Rainer Gallery, which I started with, uh, co-founded with three of my friends from grad school. Um, we did this. We started it just a few months after grad school um, as a way to continue working with artists and uh, we took the for-profit gallery route, although I don't think it's ever really made a profit. <laughs> um, and it was really a partnership where all, all of us paid in equally each month to, month to rent. Um, and if we could sell enough artwork, we didn't have to pay in for rent. So that was kind of the model that would work there. Um, here's a photo from yeah, so. Hunker Down, which, um, uh, uh, featured Mae Wilson and Mee Mogensen, uh, who me is an undergrad, Mae was not. Um, yes, but, uh, and Emily, uh, curated the show at Boss Rainer in 2015? Something like that, yeah. Um, I also was the co-founder of the Parking Lot Art Fair with the artist Jenny Shera. Um, this was like a guerrilla art fair that happened outside uh, Art Market in, at Fort Mason. Um, we had an open call to any artist to participate. They just had to come at like 5 a.m. and park their car in the public parking lot. And uh, so this was like a we, I don't think we put any money into it. We really just sort of made it happen. Um, and then another project that I did was the San Francisco Gallery Tally in 2017, which was just a spreadsheet-based movement where uh, I sort of guerrilla girl style uh, all the artists or all the galleries and art spaces in the Bay Area and uh, looked into how their gender parity was as far as representation and showing. And then I opened the spreadsheet up to the world so that anyone could start inputting data into it. Um, and yeah, that was another project. Um, and it, it sounds like someone might be like milking a cow somewhere. So you may want to uh, 
Mute yourself. Mute yourself. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and then, uh, obviously, as I, I said in uh, 2019, we opened the uh, doors of Beka, which um, you can see here, um, with a mission to break down the barriers between the art world and the rest of, of the world and to make lives better through practical engagements with uh, contemporary art. Um, there are three components to the work that we do. Innovative exhibitions um, in which we present the work of nationally and internationally renowned artists. I actually don't know if we've hit uh, international <laughs> renown yet. Um, skill building um, in which we bring artists into educational interactions to share their, uh, uh, their skills as artists and, entrep and entrepreneurs with the locals who need those skills and ecosystem uh, uh, development is the third leg um, in which we create, compile, and collect resources for artists in Buffalo who wish to, to uh, grow their uh, careers. Um, and then in August of 2019, we launched the first issue of Cornelia Magazine, which is a visual art review for Western New York and Southern Ontario um, that came out of a workshop that Lindsay uh, uh, Preston Zappis, who's on the left here, um, uh, did um, last June. And the third issue of the magazine um, is going out di digitally now as of uh, 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 last week. And Cornelia is definitely a, a thing that since the COVID thing started has taken on more urgency yeah. and weight. And Cornelia is sort of a project that occurred out of a project, right? Buffalo was, Arbica was our like bigger project and out of our desire to um, nurture the ecosystem here, uh, we identified that there were just like no art, or, there was no art reviews. There was no, the local papers and the local magazines don't um, review art anymore. And the same thing was actually happening in Toronto, which is a much, much bigger city. Um, but when we sort of identified <laughs> that as a need, we started another project. <laughs> so. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, uh, that's a great way into like, obviously here we'll be talking primarily about art spaces and art related things, um, but we think that the kind of uh, core tenet of starting with who do you want to be your audience and how do you want to make your work relevant to them um, is always a great s s starting point for any project. Um, and like Cornelia was a thing that when we started Bika was not in our minds at all. And it just, we, as we did the work, we realized that there was a real need there, not just for reviews, but kind of counterintuitively a uh, print uh, uh, publication. And I think especially in this moment, it's really good to think about uh, maybe you want a project space for real, but maybe you actually are really think maybe your project is something else. Um, there's so many things that could happen in the future. <laughs> so uh, we tried to keep it a little looser. Um, the first really step though that we've used when we've and done any of these projects is, is to really define our priorities um, and really think about what we want our art space to do for the community that we live within. So this document that you see here is a very early iteration of what um, we were thinking Bika would be. We actually were working on this before we moved to Buffalo. So this is something I remember working on while I was sitting at work one day. Um, 
but sort of through this kind of iterating and brainstorming and working through um, what Vika was going to be, we landed on what some of our biggest priorities for Vika are, which are really about um, bringing people into, bringing the community in Buffalo into um, practical engagements with contemporary art. So really trying to bust down the wall of like art is a thing that sits on an ivory throne. Um, and then the other one is to uh, expand opportunities for artists who and build an ecosystem where someone could actually thrive as an artist in Buffalo instead of having to be in New York or San Francisco or some other very expensive city. Um, so some of the questions that you should think about when you're defining the priorities is if you're doing this project to make money. Sometimes people make that work, but you might want to try something else if that's your primary goal. Um, it can be a really good way, though, to, uh, you know, build a community and a way to start into other, pro other jobs. Um, we have plenty of friends who started Project Spaces and went on to work in traditional galleries. Um, but you could also be doing it to support your peers and friends through exhibition opportunities. Um, you could be doing it to set up a local art infrastructure that's directed more towards exhibiting artists in your community who maybe don't get opportunities as much. That was something that we felt was really important in San Francisco. Um, so the answers of these questions will really help to help you set up a framework that will help you then design the rest of the project. Um, these boundaries are really good for this kind of work because they help you stay on task and they also help you make decisions. Um, very often we're approached with ideas that seem really exciting from the beginning, but then when we start to actually think about them against our priorities and mission, we realize that like maybe they aren't really worth um, following through with. So uh, we found it really helpful to be, have these priorities defined for ourselves. Yeah, and it, it sounds kind of uh, startup-y, um, but like these are things that we go back to again and again and again every time we don't know what to do next or like now where we feel like we don't know where to find our relevance and what we can do to uh, actually be useful and not just be on Instagram. Um, and it, it, laying... Uh, these things out can just help uh, streamline your thinking. Um, the next step is to really share your ideas a lot. Share them with lots of different people um, and really like talk them to death. When we first had the idea for Bika, we made a deck that was just a very uh, basic deck. And I remember I gave a presentation to the director of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts because I just wanted to hear what she thought about it. Um, and then when we came to Buffalo, we started talking about it with almost anyone who would listen. And one of the things that we found when we started sharing the original ideas for Bika were that um, something very similar to it actually already existed in Buffalo. Uh, it's actually this project you can see here, Assembly House 150. It's a really incredible project and you should look it up. But um, suddenly we were like, oh my God, we don't want to do something that somebody's already doing, especially because they already have the resources and the sort of energy. Um, so that kind of sent us back to rethinking what our project was, which is good. But um, basically the idea is that if you share your idea a lot, you get feedback, you can make it stronger, and you also will be able to identify those moments of like, oops, maybe that's not what I need to do. Um, and uh, especially in a small art world like Buffalo, talking out loud of, of, um, of, about things, um, one, will help you find like-minded people who want to help or have feedback um, and two uh, keeps you accountable because it's uh, it can be quite um, embarrassing to say that you are going to do a big thing and then to not do it so <laughs> um, and we found here that discovering what the actual needs of the Buffalo art world were and how we could be relevant uh, to to them took a really long-term dive into 
the scene here. Um, and so we, we, we thought that we moved back here at the end of uh, 2017. We thought that we would have a space and Bika signage and a plan by like March of like 2018. Um, and we realized as uh, um, Emily said that we really had to kind of uh, go back to the drawing board and see what is kind of like the most important niche that we could fill. Um, and uh, I don't know where my notes went, that's fine. Um, and uh, the project that emerged as Bika was kind of both more uh, mundane in that it, it was much more exhibition and artist focused and not as vocational focused, um, but also smaller, much more flexible um, uh, projects that were less kind of time and resource in, um, in intensive than we had thought at, at the uh, start. And that has, uh, allowed us to be extremely flexible when it comes to like, oh, wow, it turns out we need to start a magazine now. Or uh, last summer, we uh, started a, a gallery in our apartment um, because um, local artists, again, didn't have a whole lot of spaces to show. And there were not a lot of um, self-starting project space models. Um, and we, when we realized that, that 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 was an easy, free thing for us to do um, and that we had the bandwidth to do it, um, it, it was much easier. Um, accounting for resources. Obviously, we couldn't find a um, good photo for this, uh, but this goes way beyond a, um, financial, uh, um, a, a, uh, financial accounting. Um, think about your access to spaces, access to tools, access to bodies and people who want to help, um, access to uh, living space. Um, for Bika, we knew that if we launched this in LA and it was La Ica or uh, New York, um, that, that uh, we, one, wouldn't have um, access to a group of donors here that were eager to be a part of a new thing. Um, uh, and, uh, we knew that exhibition space, living space, contractors, all of those things would be much more expensive. Um, and one really great perk about Buffalo is that there was an, uh, actual need for a new art space that was drawing in, um, new younger audiences. Um, and, and so that, that, that need is itself a resource. And your resource might be as simple as like, you have a spare bedroom, yeah. like those kind of things. I think just thinking <coughs> about every thing that you have at your disposal. Um, again, one of the things with, uh, I like to go back to Boston Rainer, um, you know, that was a project that we couldn't have done, that none of us could have done alone, but when there were four of us, suddenly financially, that was feasible, and so the resource there was, uh, was friends who could each pay $200 a month to run an art space, um, instead of one of us having to pay the whole, the whole bunch of rent. Which is a great way into financial oh, yeah. viability. viability. Um, so this will obviously look very different for um, different projects. Um, as I said, for Bika, um, I had prior uh, in college uh, interned at some local uh, art spaces, knew some board members, um, and we knew that that uh, we would have donors here, um, but in order to interest donors, they want to see uh, tax deductible perks. Um, and, and so in order for them to get that, we need to be a nonprofit. Um, and being a, a 501c3 um, is great because it uh, opens the, the door to the really big grants. Um, like the Warhol uh, foundations, um, but it also means that your 
organization will have a lot more uh, oversight in the form of a uh, board um, and a lot more just reporting on uh, your taxes mm -hmm. than if you're just an LLC, which yeah. to our understanding seems like they can do almost anything. Yeah, there's um, other things you can't, um, you have to be a little more cautious about what you do politically. Um, there's definitely advantages to going either way. And um, yeah, we felt that 501c3 made sense for us, but I think a lot of organizations who feel, or a lot of people who think they have to be a 501c3 <coughs> actually probably could exist in other ways, so. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, on that, yeah, like, so if, uh, if you do not want to go the full non profit route. Um, there are organizations like Fractured Atlas um, that will act as pass-throughs for your mm -hmm. applications and things. Um, and I, I think it should be said that like one big component of the financial viability of Bika is that uh, we don't pay ourselves. Um, and that is a point that we badly want to get to in the next few years. Um, but uh, uh, it does um, allow us to put a lot more into exhibitions um, and things like that. But do just keep in mind that if, if you want to draw a salary out of a 501c3, you need board confirmation and all kinds of uh, uh, details. So. Just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, we love to be um, transparent too. Uh, one of the, I think the first things that we did even before we had space was draw up contracts. Um, and uh, uh, contracts just obviously lay out financial uh, uh, commitments and um, if anything goes wrong, as as uh, somebody did when uh, uh, with the Bonanza exhibition, um, when it comes to uh, reimbursing artists and kind of uh, where blame goes for things going wrong, contracts can uh, really make that clear. I also think being transparent goes a lot further than just contracts. I think that. Um, you know, if you do go the route of having a partner in your project, being really transparent about what your motivations are and what your personal priorities are. You know, your, your project space might have um, priorities, but your personal priorities might be different. And so it's really important for you to lay those on the table um, in all of your, uh, like, conversations with artists, being really transparent about um, what you are able to pay them, if you're going to do a 50-50 split, if you're going to have a consignment, all of that stuff is really important to lay on the table immediately before you ask someone to say yes or anything like that because um, no one wants to say yes to a project and then find out like, oh, I'm not going to get paid for this and I'm not going to get to do any of the things I want to do and now I want to back out but I feel bad. It's just better to be transparent across the board. Um, that's one of our real values here. Yeah. Programming, which obviously sounds like uh, the most fun and exciting part of having a uh, space. Um, we tr tr try to let um, priorities define programming and priorities, as we said, are uh, defined by the audience um, and, and who you want to be using uh, your space and who you want your work to be important to. Um, at Bika, we, we used um, each exhibition in our first year to kind of reach out to a uh, audience that we had seen had been overlooked by uh, our sp uh, spaces here. Um, and so here's a photo from Bonanza's uh, fashion show Last May, um, there is in the art world here that there, there's a very uh, clear 
segregation by age and all, all kinds of other things. Um, but uh, uh, I'm having a brain fart. Uh, so we, 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 we knew that we wanted to uh, create a space that would appeal to young people. And one of the ways to do that was to work with uh, um, Bonanza, who did a, a, a call for models for their fashion show here. Um, and the people that we got in for that event, um, I think we, we had just not seen it, any other art things here in, um, in Buffalo. Um, um, so you've got it amplify once you do something. Professionalism makes your project <laughs> more legible to the rest of the world. Um, I also don't think that everything needs to be super professional. Some of the most uh, interesting projects that we've seen have also been a little bit unprofessional, but I think it's just important to be intentional and think about how you want to look and how you want to appear and who you'll want, who will work with you and who will come to you based on your appearance. Um, so yeah, it's important to be le legible to the audience that you want to attract. Um, we are strong believers in writing clear and uh, concise press releases, for example. We're not the No type. theory. We don't do any theory in our press releases. We don't do any poetry in our press releases. More power to people who can do that, but Buffalo just doesn't have an art world that can respond to that. It's just, it is a turnoff to people instead of um, something that invites them in. Um, we also felt like for us it was really important to pay for, a graph, for graphic design. Um, you know, y'all are artists, you, I'm sure you have ability to do a little bit of this kind of thing, but it's really important to think about what you look like um, in the physical space and in like a digital space. Um, let's see, and having that stuff worked out makes, yeah, actually frees up a lot of time because you don't have to, every time you like make a postcard or something, you don't have to like start from the beginning every time. It's a lot nicer to get to have a sort of a layout and just work with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think it's really important to be ready to brag about the work that you're doing. Be ready to talk about it. Be ready to share it with press. Be ready, ready to, um, you know, tell people that you worked really hard and you did something awesome and it's important. Uh, this is kind of how you begin your career and um, this is how you begin your reputation. And I imagine that if you're in this, you have some desire to be some kind of leader. <laughs> so uh, don't be afraid to brag. And, and um, again, it, it might be particular to Buffalo, um, but you know, the word gets out, people know that we exist and then you know, they might not be coming in, but then when we meet them, give them a card, um, and they realize that like, it's us behind the whole thing, um, they become uh, much more engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and besides marketing and uh, design stuff, the uh, other great way to amplify um, your work is, is through partnerships and collaborations with, uh, with like-minded or organizations and artists. Um, and so uh, on the left here is, is a logo for a project that we have been working with um, the University at um, Buffalo on called Work in Real Time, which is a kind of Shark Tank live performance Instagram TV show um, uh, that uh, grants uh, $1,500 to a local artist uh, three times a semester. Um, and again, that's a, a thing that was uh, not really on our roadmap at all. Um, and a local artist had the germ of the idea, went to UB, UB uh, 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 brought us in and th through that all of our work, our marketing, our messaging is amplified and grows. Um, and, and then on the right here um, is uh, the website for the uh, 
Buffalo Center for Art and Technology, uh, which is a uh, or organization here that we love. Um, and early this spring, I do fear that this won't happen now. Um, they approached us about doing a young, uh, a young uh, curators program. Um, and again, this was like not on our minds at all. And when they brought this up to us, we were like, oh my God, why did we not have this idea? Um, but they brought this to us because they were willing to go to all of the grant writing, funding. Um, and so th through these uh, uh, partnerships, your resources can uh, become uh, much greater. <clears throat> um, this is one that I think is really important and that we get uh, confused about a lot. It's, uh, it's really important to not let your dreams get in the way of your reality. So, you know, we started this and I was like, we're starting a museum, basically. This is a serious institution that people are going to have to take seriously. Um, but often I find that I'm frustrated because we're not that yet. <laughs> There's no way we could be. So it's, and actually it's better that we're not. We don't need to be a big fancy museum or anything like that. So I just, we just have to keep remembering that momentum will build as we put things out into the world and continue to like live with the values that we have set up for our organization. Um, we, one of the things that's great about being fairly new is that you're still pretty small and flexible. We, since we aren't paying ourselves in a time like this, we are not actually in the same dire financial straits as a lot of other organizations because we don't have payroll. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and also on chill, just like it, um, especially if you are doing this work as a kind of volunteer, um, be wary of, oh, um, uh, over, Extending yourself and your programming. I mean, one thing that I, I think that uh, partnerships are awesome, but sometimes it's just like, whoa, this is way cool, but like we do not have the capacity to do this. There's uh, too much on our plate. Um, and even if you love this kind of work, burnout is like really still real. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, try to take uh the work that you do very seriously um but don't take yourself uh too, 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 uh too seriously and try to roll with change and this image here also is uh from a um one very cool and relaxed program we did which was a soup salon sunday we did it at a friend's in a friend's studio um, and honestly, it was one of our most successful programs. We had three different artists slash performers do sort of comedy routines. And there were probably like 30 people there and we sold them soup and they uh, sat through these crazy performances. And um, yeah, some of these like most chill projects end up being the um, most successful. So yeah, don't let perfection get in the way of cool, fun things that are um, a little more spur of the moment. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, nothing lasts forever. Um, many projects, oftentimes the best projects, because this means that they've fulfilled their function and their role, um, have limited lifespans. Um, th it, this kind of thing, Bika at least, is not a corporation. Um, we don't feel like we need to adapt to every up new financial quarter to uh, maintain a bottom line. Um, and if you feel like an idea has uh, run its course, it's okay to let that go as long as uh, you don't experience any uh, financial burden from that, uh, even okay, if you do, yeah. yeah. But one one perk of being a nonprofit is is that it does wall the person off from financial burdens. Um, but um, even better than that, if you find uh, 
someone who has a great plan to bring this thing to the next level or to just turn it into something else completely and they have a vision and you feel okay handing off the reins, um, that's awesome because that means that your word and your mission has, has, has you know, gained followers. Estate planning for art spaces. Yes. <laughs> and finally, ask for help. Um, uh, we ask for help all the time yeah. from all kinds of different people. Um, we really try to ask people from all over the country for help when we don't know how to do something. Uh, yeah, yeah. When, when it's just us, we are curating, doing social media, installing work, uh, writing grants. Uh, we gallery sit, which is kind of the like worst part of the whole thing. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just everything else um and and it's it's it, especially if you can afford to it's really great to id your weaknesses um and just uh hand work off uh where you need to mm -hmm. and that's the end now you can ask us all your questions maybe we should stop screen sharing too so that we can mm -hmm. see your faces Thank you so much for all of that information. I feel like it was an incredible overview. <laughs> oh, wow. There's a lot more people. I know. That. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hey, we, got off, we got some more people in here, which is hey. great. Um, we do want to open up to questions either in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask questions directly. You can also give comments of adoration. So yeah. They're also welcomed. Is anyone here trying to start a project space or thinking about uh, it or have any ideas? Yeah, I'm definitely thinking about it. But before I even start to flesh it out, I mean, I wanted to ask you two about the process of applying for grants. I mean, every time I think about starting something, I mean, money definitely, you know, is, the, is at the top of the, yes. the list yeah. when it comes to starting anything. And so, like, I just wanted to ask you two, you know, when it comes to grants, and we all know that grants can be a little intimidating, where do you guys begin your search and how do you filter out the right and wrong grants? And how did you guys go about asking the people to join your board? Yeah, for grants, we, I mean, we started pretty small and in, in, uh, in Buffalo, we have an organization called Art Services Initiative and they both offer grants themselves and they also, um, are sort of a hub for other people to list grants and stuff. So we are, we work with them a lot. Actually, we were like pretty quick to ask for a meeting with them so we could talk to them about what all the things they offered were. And then, um, you know, we really yeah, just started some of the smaller ones. We realized that, uh, especially on the smaller ones, we probably like over prepared. You yes. know, we spent like maybe two weeks <coughs> writing a grant and then our first grant which which <laughs> was for the uh uh deck grant which is through the new york state uh council for the arts and it's that really is, similar to an alternative exposure yeah. grant at soax though in the bay area um and th there was definitely like the the first couple of months there, there was a kind of chicken and egg thing of like we need money uh but to get money we need to be a nonprofit. To be a nonprofit, we need a bit of money to pay a lawyer to sort the stuff out because that actually, th those first steps of just the IRS documents, um, I have to admit, I found it more baffling than I thought it would. Um, uh, and then uh, with the board too, um, to be very frank, I feel like we have uh, arranged a very amenable board that would Which be... Which is what you're supposed to yeah. do in the, at the beginning of something like this. The, I mean, check with, if you go the nonprofit route, check with a lawyer, but um, boards really don't need to be that big. Uh, it, you get to make the rules, really, for your board. You mm -hmm. write your own bylaws. Um, and so our board is five people, mm -hmm. um, and they're five of our friends, to mm -hmm. be honest. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but they're... <laughs> Also, people who understand our mission, um, understand things like uh, for the first two years, like they're, they're just 
details of, of like, uh, I need to be both, uh, both the vice president and uh, the treasurer of this nonprofit um, and like naming officers of the or, uh, organization. You just want to trust that they won't want someone else for those first few years. Yeah. They trust that you've got the reins and that you're not going to go financially off the rails and mm -hmm. start to sign checks to your cousin or whoever. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> Um, I'd like to add something to in terms of being in between nonprofit and individual or LLC or however you kind of decide to go. You can also find fiscal sponsors. Yes. So fiscal sponsors basically take a 10% <laughs> off the top of all the money that you receive. Um, but you can apply for a number of grants. They're only eligible to 501c3 organizations through your fiscal sponsor. Um, and that 10% essentially covers a lot, and then you don't pay any taxes on that income, so it really offsets it. And I, and I recommend if you, like, you get to a pretty serious place, but becoming a nonprofit is a, a long process or it feels too hard, that's a good place to kind of start, I think. Sure. Yeah, one of the things that we, when we were going through that struggle, that's when we sort of started to, we were also making these presentations to donors and talking to people about what money we needed and we were able to find people to help us get through basically the first year without grants, which then made it easier to go into the second year applying for grants and everything. Um, but yeah, that's, it's sort of a, a a chicken or the egg situation and really a lot of it is just like careful budgeting figuring out what the how to budget that first year can be really tricky well thank you guys mm -hmm. um there was a question about how do you deal with disagreeing with each other when working as a team i think it's a great oh, question we had a lot of that uh just preparing this presentation because we just think very, very I, I differently teach and so i'm very comfortable just kind of like here are some slides I'll just wing it now um, Emily's not uh, and we have to compromise and figure out a way to make things work and I feel like usually that takes the form of uh, I feel like we share 90% of the work but all of the work is done kind of independently and then passed back and forth mm -hmm. um, and it just goes through multiple drafts and uh, at one point we just kind of compromise and joined. let things go. Mad, Mad letter, letter up! <laughs> Who we owe an email <laughs> very badly. Um, but hey, yeah. Hi. I just, I was just in this town hall meeting, so I, I oh, wanted no, to, you don't even want to know. I really wanted to be part of this, so wow. I have a class of one, but You're fine. I, I owe you an email too. But okay. Yeah, <laughs> see you, we can talk. It was good to see you, man. Yeah. yeah, likewise. But yeah, uh, yeah, we do a lot of compromising. We do a lot of uh, part of being transparent, even when you're married, is being really clear about what your strengths and weaknesses are, what you're interested in doing, and what you're absolutely not interested in doing. Um, so yeah, we try to be really communicative about that. It doesn't always work. But um, I worked with three partners before, again, just like a lot of, a lot of opinions to share. We would have weekly meetings for Boss and Rainer, and often they were just arguments. <laughs> but I also feel like, uh, you know, there's a way to argue that is uh, positive and helps people get on the same page eventually. So there's some arguing, there's some making clear what you're going to do and what you can't do. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, share the work that you want to, uh, but if like Emily hates to install work, I actually enjoy it. So that's easy. It's on my plate. I don't like um, to say where it's going to go. Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> yeah. actually put it <laughs> um, With uh, Cornelia, I'm uh, uh, very happy to be the, uh, uh, editor and deal with writers I don't really want to deal with advertisers and that's all uh, yeah so um, just have a lot of honest 
conversation by Matt <laughs> um, about what you want to do and don't want to do. I would also say in terms of collaboration that I have, I've had trying to find a, a pace where no one is pushing people into work or like if you're someone who likes to really get things done really fast or stay up late or something, figuring out how to communicate really good boundaries. Like don't text me ever about a work thing. Only send the email and like kind of being able to have these ways that you allow people to come to the workload themselves instead of feeling like someone is telling someone else what to do. Because I think that's where a lot of tension. Yeah. Well put. Comes we have from. a lot of tension about text messages. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> text messages are not a good way to tell someone that you need something done. I think that's just yeah. <laughs> long and short. Um, we have another question that says, I'm curious about your timeline. Please, could you expand on the chicken egg issue? How soon did you apply for nonprofit status? We got our nonprofit status. So uh, I said so we moved back here in December of 2017. We had our non nonprofit status by June of 2018. Um, and the first show didn't open until January of last year. Um, and it, it just came out of like, uh, you know, spring of 2018 we started to feel the urgency of like wanting to find space needing money that every application that we looked at um uh needed a 501c3 um and uh i don't i i we knew about fractured atlas at the time i don't know why we didn't go yeah. that route I, i'm still happy not to oh because of donors because donors uh don't get the uh tax oh, the tax write off yeah mm. um so uh uh and and then asi here too um was acting as a uh fiscal sponsor for um performance and theater stuff but not for visual, visual arts, arts. Mm -hmm. um and then it like it, it it was it was confusing and we still talk about like maybe we should be something else um and and we had a conversation with uh, someone here who has been on a lot of boards and he said that like, oh, well, a lot of donors and foundations are kind of like sick of dealing with 501c3. nonprofits, but it's like, hey man, if you could tell us how else you would take advantage of tax deductions, mm -hmm. then like we were happy to do that, but like it was hard to yeah, raise really any money without depends on your city but yeah so we didn't have to do a five-year business plan or anything I think there's a lot of sort of misinformation about what you need to get a 501c3 literally what we did is we hired a lawyer who we paid $500 it was like 700 bucks which was $700 probably a lot it. it would be elsewhere but. to uh file the paperwork and in the paperwork we needed to provide our mission um our, our, our description of our activities yeah. which was essentially our mission um are the yeah. board bylaws which we basically just copy and pasted from the internet and then later once we had our board in place rewrote to be what we actually wanted them to be and then uh i think that i think that in the check was all that yeah. we had to send this lawyer um, um and one of the things too is that you do, like you can. One of the things I just found the non-profit thing on our own kind of baffling, but it, you don't have to um, file your nine ninety as a non-profit until year three of your existence. So as as long as you're tracking expenses and 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 and, and stuff like there you you can kind of go into it a bit, I think, more loose and without a uh, 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 lawyer. Yeah. Um, For some grants, we've had to provide like a five-year budget and stuff. Um, which we find which, very hard to do. Yeah, it's complicated when you're like, we're not even five years old. What do you mean? What are we going to do in five years? <laughs> yeah. And it uh, looks like there's a, it doesn't ever feel um difficult to stay true to your vision and mission and still function slash procure funding 
Um, do you want me to? Say? We might disagree. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna go first. Okay, yeah. I feel like it has maybe because I've worked in nonprofits for a long time. I'm really wary of this concern because I think it happens to a lot of nonprofits. They see a grant that looks like, oh, if I can just work with children, I can get all of these other grants. And so they change what they do. Mission creep is the sort of industry term. And so they change what they do so they can get that grant. I am so against this that I just like, if that's, if we look at all these grants and we'll see like, oh, this looks like sort of it could fit to something that we're already doing then yes, we would apply for it. But there's plenty of grants that I'm just like, oh, looks like they want to fund animals and kids and we're not really working with animals or kids. So we're not going to apply for that. Um, and I think that makes it easier that way. And then the other thing that we, I again, just really lucky to have here is, indiv- is donors who are individual people who are more interested in talking to us and have relationships with us. And so they don't care what we're doing really they just are like happy that we're here and doing something which (laughs) is maybe a benefit of being in a weird little city that no one else wants to be in (laughs) um i i I, and i do think that if we had been drawing salaries off the start this would be much more complicated and we probably would be going towards any kind of grant that could keep us alive Mm -hmm. um and it you know it kind of sucks to both work on top of Vika, but I work. Yeah. Also a both great that, so. grant writer will tell you though, that you, you take that, you take whatever they ha- have said they're looking for, and then you find a way to bend what you're already doing into what they're looking for and sell it to them as what they want instead of uh, making a new pro, like any time that you're like, oh, we're going to apply this grant so we can start this new program that we've never started before. I think that's the wrong way to go yeah, about that's, funding. That's a I think lot of resources. come up with the thing you want to do and then find the way to bend that one grant. <laughs> and uh, yeah, pr- yeah, grant um, writing is a real special skill of finding a hole and yeah, wiggling your way uh, through it. <laughs> back to Barry's uh, uh question about grants is like we might actually yeah um we might actually be happier to pay a grant writer before we pay ourselves yeah because it's just it will be money well spent we're both competent writers we understand our uh our mission but like if, if you've ever sat uh sat on a grant review panel you know that the like the language of grants is kind of its own Thing. And there are like keywords and buzzwords and things that get uh, reviewers like, oh, this is this is it. This is the thing. Yeah, if you can uh, find an opportunity to re- to sit on a grant review panel, that is like a really a really solid thing to get to just be like, oh, that's what they're looking at. I see. Yeah. Um. Uh. Wow. Can cat sign up for that job? Let's talk about that cat. Um. And Barry. Uh, asked, how does Bika influence your art practice? Great question. Still navigating that one myself. Um, I feel like um, there are uh, a lot of what Bika is now came out of a kind of burnout of being an artist and feeling like uh, art exhibitions are great, but like it, they're sort of exercises in narcissism um and that like all of what is most progressive and most promising and uh compelling about art obviously in galleries and art fairs doesn't actually happen um all all of these ideas of community and uh i don't know um and and so uh uh bika has been an outlet for um, a lot of my ideas that I actually, I actually have a hard time kind of adapting those ideas into my own work, still working on it. Um, but certainly there's a like aspect of, yeah, I don't know, care and patience and time that goes across both. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, we're down to go. Yeah, we can go past. Yeah. There's just one more question here, right? about managing how to work on the nonprofit and still having time to do other work. Uh, yes, 
this has been the um, biggest struggle, probably for both of us yeah. through the whole thing. Um, when we first moved here, neither of us had jobs. I like literally was offered a part-time job on our drive to Buffalo, and I took that. Um, so for the first year we were here, I was working part-time in Niagara Falls at a museum doing marketing, and I had another uh, like part-time contract gig that was actually still from San Francisco. Um, and so I was doing both of those and working on starting Bika, which was a lot. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, I luckily am good at is juggling a lot of things. I'm unhappy when I'm not very, <laughs> very busy, so it works okay for me. Um, but it's definitely not for everyone, and I, you know, also long for the day when I can work one job. <laughs> Just play Animal Crossing. <laughs> Just play Animal um, Crossing all day. <laughs> but, um, so it's, yeah, I think it's just really hard and it's time management. And, um, my day jobs are all in marketing, which is like firmly based in like planning and project management. And so I bring those skills into Bika and, um, yeah, try to do so much work that takes the things that take a lot of time and are not very creative, like, uh, building web pages and stuff, all that stuff is templated. So it doesn't take me very long and I can just knock it out in a few hours. That's what gallery sitting is for <laughs> doing your stupid work that you don't want to do. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, for me, I will be very frank and tell you it's not ever, it's not ever super easy. One, huge 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 advantage that we have is that we don't pay rent because we to live um in our apartment um, yeah. yeah um and that's because uh uh my dad owns, yeah different. and that we we had this was gonna be a temporary thing and it we're still here i will um, point out though that if you want to move to buffalo average rent is like four hundred dollars yeah so. Um, but like, that, that, that was a, that was a like really big defining resource when we knew that we would be able to live for cheap and put a lot more energy into Bika, that was, that, that's just, that's a huge boon. Yeah. Um, and, um, teaching to, to me, teaching in B Buffalo is even more dire than, in the uh, Bay, say, like the, the uh, adjunct pay is terrible. Um, I drive uh, two hours uh, each way, t uh, two days a week to Alfred t to uh, teach. Um, last year I was teaching in Rochester, um, which is like 90 minutes east of here, and that was. Uh, 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 three days a week. Um, and, uh, yeah, when I don't have a job, I get freaked out. I get really freaked out. It's never, it never gets easier to solve. And yeah. it's freelance photography, <laughs> not a thing like that, that it, I think it should be said that, um, uh, we wanted to start Beacon in a place where we would have an impact. And that absolutely is, in Buffalo. It's not LA. It's not some scene that we like don't know and don't have roots in. Um, Denver, um, Emily's from uh, Colorado uh, and we love Denver, but like the amount that we would be paying in rent would require that much more work and then less time on Bika. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of my art practice, that that is, I actually, um, my studio is at home too. Um, and so that saves money and time. Um, and, uh, I would say that I probably have like two and a half studio days a week, three days a week of, um, uh, work stuff and teaching and then two and a half to kind of like overlapping of like only be good work. Mm -hmm. And then and then zero days for sleeping in. 
the weekends for we me are a not dog. a thing. We yeah. got a dog, yeah. so we can't sleep in now anyway. Uh, but that, that, like, my studio days are uh, uh, usually the weekend. Yeah, I think another, I mean, something interesting that we'll start to see is as the effects of shelter in place We'll be putting businesses in really precarious positions and a lot of businesses will be closing down and storefronts and cities will have a very different level of like foot traffic and activity. I actually think there will be a lot of possible opportunities for like arts activation of spaces. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that it would be really prudent for people who are interested in that to kind of try to keep an eye out or just to talk to other people or business, even maybe cold ca calling businesses that you know are struggling to see if there's ways you can like partner with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, I mean for Boss and Rainer, the initial rent or the initial lease that we signed on our spot, which was inside of artist studios when we first opened before we moved into Minnesota Street Project, um, we signed a four month lease, which, or maybe it was five months, but it was essentially enough time for each of us to curate one show. And that was like, that was the whole, when we started our plan, that was our whole plan was just to each curate one show. Um, and then, you know, it snowballed into something that still exists. But um, I think that one of the things in like, take a chill pill and be realistic is like, don't worry about planning forever. <laughs> right away like if you've got the idea and if you've got if you find the space or if you find the one thing that helps it work just do it for a little bit and see yeah. how it goes see if you can manage the time and if you can't put it to rest it's all right yeah. <laughs> things um, can die and and yeah like i there, there's still depending on how the next couple of weeks and months go like there's still this possibility that bika will have to like a water bear just kind of dry up and like wait I feel until like it wouldn't it die. We just no, it won't space. die. It just it will it will have to kind of like stall for a bit and then with a bit of water and care it will bing back into life. <laughs> um, but plant. yeah, yeah, um, and and like we're a, a, if we had a, a staff and payroll that would be impossible. But since it's just us, um, that is actually not the worst of all outcomes. Yeah. Um, all right, any last questions before we wrap up here with Emily and Nando? Email us anytime. Yes, please. We're available. Check out their website, check out the publication. They have so many opportunities for artists to write or present or, you know, collaborate. I mean, I think that Emily and Nando are definitely a great resource for you to know as an artist and to keep an eye on. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for all your amazing projects and thank I you, hope Jack. to see you soon. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye everybody.